Why should you read the Volkhozgan saga by Lois McMaster Bujold? This is the most successful series in Hugo Awards history. Uh, it's won three best novels, it's won a best series award, and it's been nominated uh, multiple times beyond that, including for short stories. I've uh, so there's overall I should say there are sixteen books and at uh, sixteen novels, five shorter stories in this big science fiction series. Yet it's not particularly read now. I feel like I don't. I'm the only one of my booktube friends who who knows it. I think or who's read it. Um, I'm a massive fan, and uh, I've read six novels, three of the shorter works. I think this represents thirteen novels and four of the shorter works. I don't have um, the the po well, but most of these are omnibuses. Basically, I don't have the later run. By the way, can we just very quickly reflect on the mess of American print habits? We've got the omnibuses alone. We've got mass market paperback. We've got uh, big trade, like these ones. I've got a couple of those ones. And uh, we've got this kind of weird small trade. This is actually quite a nice size, I should say, controversially, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, so I've got most of the series. I've also got a video up about her, Bujol's big fantasy series. The World of Five Gods. I've got. I've done a review for one book, and I've done a why you should read. This is, um, as I say, I'm not the world's biggest expert. I've read about half the series, just under half the series, and I wouldn't uh, be pushing this except no one else is. This is a vastly underappreciated series. I would. Uh, I'm planning to read more soon. I'm kind of tempted to start another novel very soon, uh, maybe in this month. This is. A space opera, I should say. I guess, generally speaking, it's a space opera. It combines lots of sub-genres. It combines uh, military sci-fi with politics. Well, different books are different things. Military sci-fi, politics, intrigue, and uh, things like that. Scientific discovery, romance, romantic fantasy. Uh, and certainly, you could accurately describe the fantasy books she writes often as romantic fantasy. Uh, but um, in space... Uh, using sort of uh, the tropes of romantic fantasy in space. She gets compared to Georgette Heyer, the, who was a detective novel and Regency romance writer of the 20th century. And it's a fair comparison. Those are things that interest her a lot. Um, she is, yeah, there's vast range. There's vast range in Bujold. And I think most people who like sci-fi will find one of these books to like. There are so many things she does, so many things she's interested in that you're going to run into something you like eventually. Uh, and not many authors that can that be said of. I think you get a few uh, surprising candidates, uh, someone like a, well, someone like Gene Wolfe, not surprising, but vast range, albeit they're all dense, complex. Someone like Terry Pratchett, uh, who addressed not just conceptually a wide range of things, but also was very good at engaging a kind of wide variety of characters and tones. And you, you, there are a few other authors like that, but Bujold is very good at that, um, I think, as well. Uh, so what to say next she writes effective simple attractive prose she is a very competent writer that's not meant to be damning with faint praise uh, it's meant to she's she's not the greatest stylist in the world she um, isn't absolutely gorgeous in her writing but she's very good she's very nice often funny very economical um, never dull and again, I'm not sure if that's how widely true that is true, even of quite popular authors. She's just a very technically competent uh, writer. Her big strengths, though, I would say, are characters and world building. Uh, she's good at plot in the sense her plots basically always make sense. Most of them are quite well executed. In the intrigue and the mystery stories, uh, they're, it's, they're satisfying conclusions, you know. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed finding out the, the solutions to the mysteries. But they're not her biggest strength. And by that I mean she's just okay at them. The mysteries, for instance, they're not Agatha Christie. You know, they're, they're not things that have you gripped. They're ones where you're like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's going on there. Oh, okay. You know, the things that are drawing you in are these other factors. The characters and the world building. Now, she writes, uh, basically, I think everything's third person limited. Based on, generally speaking a chief point of view character. Occasionally a book might have more than one, but I think basically always it's it's one. She has multiple key point of view characters. 
Uh, the main ones are the Vorkosigans, uh, the particularly two Cordelia Naismith, who marries Harold Vorkosigan and becomes Lady Vorkosigan, and their son, Miles Vorkosigan. They narrate, or rather, they are the viewpoint between them for over half the books. Uh, there is one book set in the past from a geneticist's point of view, I think. There's one book uh, from a doctor from a monastery world. There's one book from uh, Miles's annoying cousin, Ivan Vorpatril. Annoying, charming, wonderful, very annoying cousin, uh, son of Vorpatril. And um, one from uh, the uh, a kind of an aristocrat on a world who comes into contact with Niles. I think that's about it for the novels. And there might be one or two. Yeah, maybe I'm missing one there. But uh, yeah, you've got this interesting thing where she does these multiple points of views, but it's bound together by these four Cosigans. Apart from Falling Free, set in the past, uh, everything else links in in some way to their story, including the one, the one big standalone that has nothing to do with their story, connects to my secondary characters who you have met in their stories. These characters are all, they're really interesting. She's very good at drawing complex, subtle characters with different motivations, different personalities, different voices, uh, different styles, but who are, what one, and this is massively true about all of her writing, Bougenot's writing, is they're humane, attractive, you sympathise with them, you're behind them, and uh, though that's not what every author has to do, I think it's thing to praise her for is that uh, she, I mean, in a way she writes good guys you root for, but that's maybe not even the way to put it. It's rather that her psychology is sympathetic and uh, pro-human, uh, pro-human. Cordelia, who's the main character of the two novels in this one, plus another one I don't have. She is a, a, a scientist from basically a liberal progressive paradise and uh, we fight, see her coming into contact with this country, this world, sorry, Barriar. Barriar has been cut off for some time from the rest of the galaxy, has gone through major war and is much more traditional, hidebound, and much more keen on survival, on systems that work under pressure, rather than kind of achieving all these other good goals um, in Cordelia's view. And she falls in love with someone there called Aral Vorkosigan, who's from a kind of grand old family, traditionalist family he's fairly you know he's moderate i guess you'd say politically in lots of ways uh, but yeah they meet um and uh, we get their romance and then we get their the the biggest character in the series is miles miles is the main character in terms of books i have he's the main character of seven that is three four five six seven eight i think yeah um eleven of something like eleven oh, no maybe ten uh, 10 or 11 uh, total of the 16 uh, Cordelia for 3 Ivan for 1 Ethan for 1 so yeah 11 I think and no 10 Katarina for 1 so yes he is their son however he's disabled he has brittle bones when he's born um, due to uh, an incident that happens that causes damage to him in the womb and uh, Barriar is not a society accepting of, of disabled people um, it doesn't like birth defects as a Spartan view of those because, and this is this is going to connect into these things about concepts and worlds because um, it has had to survive. It's become very ruthless, cruel by our standards. And um, I think that's a really interesting thing that you have, you know, the, this underdog in that society, but you're also given the perspective of the society on them. But you, Miles is wonderful. He is a bluffer. He is a charmer. He's a strategist. Um, more or less, the, the it's uh, a, an open secret. It's not. I think it's pretty much on the yeah the back of uh, his introductory book uh, that he basically scams his way into being um, the commander of a mercenary fleet um, as a young man, and that's a major plot point over the rest of the books. Uh, the Dendarii free mercenaries. So he's he's very different to his mother. That um, they are not carbon copies of each other. Uh, despite being the main characters and being the viewpoint character, being characters who might represent a lot of what Bujold believes or wants, actually they're a lot more subtle than that. Cordelia, I suspect, does represent a lot of the author's point of view um, in terms of the society that Lois Whitmaster Bujold might like. Mars is more pragmatic, um, uh, more adaptive. They both are, they're both very flexible. 
but the secondary characters are are excellent too. I think about the um, Mars's granddad, hardcore traditionist who'd been part veteran of the old wars against the occupier, um, kind of having to come to grips with a uh, disabled grandson. At Wandy Deep with his son before that, falling in love with an outlander from a particularly disagreeable world. Um, you've got characters uh, like I mean, there's a few. I won't won't say too much about uh, because it might might spoil it uh, a little bit. Uh, but yeah, uh, to be fair, Ivan Warpatrol. I haven't read the book where he's the main character, but he he's annoying in the best way. He's kind of charming, interesting. Um, lazy i think more or less or at least going with the tide not lazy but going with the tide uh, gets caught up in in miles's adventures because miles is uh, a lot more a lot has a high far higher risk threshold and far higher drive uh, but ivan is the kind of classic fop aristocrat and you meet a, a lot of other characters the two emperors you meet ezar and um gregor Rorbara, they're great uh, certainly Harold Vorkosigan, who is never the main character, but is functionally a main character in some books, particularly the early ones. Uh, he He's great uh, a, a, as well. And you you have with him the fact he's got this strong sense of honour, which complements Cordelia and challenges her. And that's one of the things, and I'm going to come on to the concepts and worlds now, is that though Bujold is a beta colony uh, kind of lady, she admires and respects the honour code of, of Barry R in a way that's surprising if we think, oh, well, the writer's going to just write down, really show us the things they like and agree with. Compare this to Ancillary Justice, which I just reviewed, and there's a big thing going on there where the author can't quite reconcile up the things she wants to criticise and the things she wants to praise. I think there's something a bit more interesting in Bujold, a bit more subtle um, and engaging different ideas. And in that case, you see that though... We might not like things about Vor society um, on Barry Yar. At the same time, um, there is something indispensable and good about Arrol that is not Cordelia couldn't get from, from Beta Colony, I think is the point. So world building, there's two ways that she world builds. One is just by the variety of societies she builds. And she, a big thing is she's spinning out things that might happen in human society based on given conditions. And here it's space opportunities, um, distance, adaptive, adaption to environment, possibilities of technology. So barrier, you know, it's the backwards world isolated by, by conditions in space uh, occupied. It's the militaristic and um, sort of traditionist society. Setaganda, very caste bound, very political, intrigue focused. Uh, Beta Colony, Progressive Liberal Utopia, Jackson's Hole, it's a corporate cartel world, uh, which, yeah, uh, you know, that that's a, gives a whole different feel to things, uh, to the other worlds you've encountered. And I think she talks about this in the Setaganda, which is in this one, uh, this omnibus, in the Setaganda comment she makes, is that you meet Setaganda as an antagonist in some books, but then in the book, Setaganda, when you go there, you have a sympathetic view of it from the inside. Not not that you need to as the reader, or that Miles, in that case, is the narrator, love this place, but that they come to understand things about it. And I think there's a big element of curiosity and understanding in Bujold's writing. And uh, there's some of that you get in the World of Five Gods too, actually, to be fair, but it's much stronger here. Here, you know, they go to these places and you find out more about why they are the way they are, why what they do is matters to them even if it doesn't matter as much to the narrator or to the um the third person narrative point of view and i think uh, that's a really important feature of speculative fiction uh, it's sympathetic and humane and that leads to the way she deals with concepts too the uh, ideas she has the you try and replicate her she's interesting i uh, so that's one world athos is a monastery world and it can be a monastery world because it can use you try and replicators to have children so you don't need women it can just be a monastery world um, she is interested in genetic splicing, in cloning, in um, reproduction, in culture clash, in um, yeah, and, and cultural divergence based on vast geographic spaces. And I think she's very good at all of that. She's it's something which, when I say ah, oh, she makes kind of interesting societies that 
it's not like she's writing hard magic systems if you allow the kind of crossover there. She's not going into all this crazy detail on the tech and on the systems. She writes decent military sci-fi, but it's not like, oh yeah, she's just the most, thr it's not hammer slammers, you know. Um, rather, I think what she, what she achieves is, there you think, ah, oh, so she's this very good character writer, very uh, interesting textured world writer. I think it's that this is where she just decides to work out some ideas in a way that you don't find many other sci-fi authors doing, which is, I think, uh, not just in the kind of purely speculative sense, but in this very uh, anthropocentric and character-focused way. Why do these things matter to people? You do get other authors like that. I actually think Kim Stanley Robinson is very good at that. I think he is quite good at tying big... Uh, technological themes to characters but lots of hard sci-fi writers and in that sense some of these books are basically hard sci-fi um, lots of hard sci-fi characters are not strong character writers they're not even strong world builders they are very good at discussing an idea and I think Bujold is great she's great at world she's great at characters and flowing out from the two she's great at exploring concepts with those tools in hand uh, and that makes her one of the most interesting speculative writers one of the most interesting sci-fi writers uh, i have read where should you uh, start um, I, as i say that's a rare mix it's something to be valued and i should say these books are also nice there's a space for books for hobbits right and i think these are books for hobbits and if you feel hobbit-esque you will like these but so where should you start that's the final question there's a lot of books 16 novels is a big series uh, they are not, yeah, there is a plot that runs through many of them. They're not something you have to read the start and the end of to know. It's not Wheel of Time to know the end of the story. They're basically all standalones. Uh, but there are, I think, much better reading entry points than others. There are really, I suppose you could say there are four-ish entry points, I would say, by most standards. One, um, this is not really an entry point, but it, doesn't spoil later uh, the later stuff is falling free the standalone that is in it's called falling free and it is in the um, omnibus miles mutants and microbes which are the two books about bodies and genetically adapted uh, subspecies of humanity who have uh, uh, four arms for working in zero g you could enter on the cordelia books and so not the later cordelia book but the first two which is Shards of Honour and Barry Yar, Shards of Honour being the first of those, which are in the omnibus Cordelia's Honour. That is a very shiny cover, metallic. You could enter in for Miles, so that's, you could enter in at Falling Free, you could enter in at Shards of Honour. You could enter in at Young Miles, which is The Warrior's Apprentice and The Vore Game, um, and a short story as well. See that one? There we go. So, yeah, that's The Warrior's Apprentice is the entry point there. And I take it it's in this one. Let's just have a check. Yeah. You could also enter in um, on the... She wrote three books that she sold, more or less as one eventually, to uh, to Jim uh, Byan. Um, and the, the three were... Shards of Honor with Cordelia, Warrior's Apprentice with Miles, which is set sometime later. And then not long after Warrior's Apprentice, there is a book called Ethan of Athos, which is this standalone monastery world doctor dude who goes out into space. Um, to Because um, the the inciting incident is they get their fetuses for uterine replication purposes and something's gone wrong and someone has to go out and find out what's happened to the big investment on uh, on new citizens of society um that's really interesting it's not i don't think it's as good as the other early books but i think it's really in, it's one of the most interesting in that it boldly attempts to deal with big issues that socially we face in lots of ways but yeah so those four books are all nominal entry points um particularly shards of honor warrior's apprentice and ethan of athos miles mystery and mayhem is the uh, omnibus for that I would probably say, I think start with Shards of Honour. I think start with Cordelia. Um, but if not, probably with Warrior's Apprentice. I think those are the two more important books and stronger books, and they set you up better. And they're very different to each other. Shards of Honour is significantly a romance. In the omnibus, it leads into Barriar, which is intrigue, action, 
uh, military, soft military stuff, not as military as some other stuff in the series. Warrior's Apprentice is coming of age, picaresque. Um, I don't know how to describe it, taking over a mercenary fleet. And the war game um, is intrigue, again. The, just to very quickly, to finish up, to go through the other omnibuses, you've got Miles Errant, which is Brothers in Arms and Mirror Dance, which involves cloning. Memory, which uh, is about, well, memory. Uh, that's a standalone, that is not an omnibus, because she didn't think it fit in it. It comes, as you can see, it come, it's like book eight or nine or something, chronologically. Miles in Love, which is Civil Camp Comar, Civil Campaign, and a short story, Winterfair Gifts, which is associated. Several of these have short stories in them. And then this one, Miles Mutants and Microbes, is the last um, omnibus so far. Falling Free and Diplomatic Immunity are the two novels in there. Uh, there are then, as I say, I think there are th uh, three others. There's Gentleman Jolie and the, the Red Queen, Cryoburn, and Captain Vorpatril's Alliance. Um, and then there's a novella, which I don't have in there, called The Flowers of Vashnoi. She is a great author. These are great books. I think they are criminally slept on. I think they could appeal to a wide range of people. They are awaiting their rediscovery. Um, and uh, I heartily recommend them to you. If you have read them, tell me what you think in the comments. And if you haven't read them, tell me if you're interested. And, uh, and maybe we could uh, talk about that. Till next time.